Mark said I'm Ryan Aker, a solutions architect. I'm based in Vancouver, and I'm a solutions architect that supports public sector uh, provincial and small crown forks, everyone west of Ontario. And I have other counterparts that support uh, healthcare, education, and uh, office. There's a team of us based in Vancouver now. So in terms of the agenda, what we're going to talk about today is benefits of the cloud. So this is some baseline knowledge, whether or not uh, you have experience in the cloud or you're new to it completely, we'll just reset and talk about some of the base benefits. We'll reiterate the shared responsibility model. We're going to go over the AWS global infrastructure, which is uh, an important topic we'll talk about, basically how we design our regions, which we'll learn about, and then disaster recovery on AWS. So basic high-level theory, and then I'll actually be demoing talking to you about one of our products that we acquired called Cloudinger, a tool that you can use to quickly get out of your disaster recovery. We'll head back over to Mark and then we'll play the game at the end. The questions that you will uh, get asked are based on content. It's your best chance to uh, win the prize. So what is Amazon Web Services? So after over a decade of building and running the highly scalable web application Amazon.com, the company realized that it had developed a core competency Building massive infrastructure and technology, and then embarked on a broad mission to serve a new customer segment. Businesses and developers with a set of their own web services that they could use to build their own uh, sophisticated and scalable applications. When we talk about the benefits of the cloud, there are five main benefits that you get on time. We'll talk a little bit about those. So the first one is understanding agility. We have the ability to spin up or create 10, 100, 1,000, thousands servers within minutes, do some computation or run an experiment, and at the end, decommission all those resources. And what that leads into cost savings. You pay for what you use on the cloud, and you're trading a capital expenditure for a variable expense. And with that, with that variable expense, you also get uh, economies of scale. It's much greater than one can achieve on their own because of the size of AWS and the customers that we have. Elasticity. Being able to expand or add resources as you need it, and then decommission at the end, similar to agility. But think about if you had a large sale, a bottom day sale, or a prime day sale, how do you meet capacity to meet that demand? You can be automatic and elastic. So you can scale up, serve that demand at the end, decommission those resources. And speed to innovate. Instead of spending time building and running uh, data centers, that time can then be spent on innovation to help your customers. Um, the last key benefit of cloud computing is the ability to go global. Because now I know that in the public sector, especially here in BC, going global for you is not something you want to do. It's the opposite. But know that that ability is there for you to, to just go deploy your workload and then part of the work. We talk about the shared responsibility model. Today, for a traditional on premise security model, customers are responsible for your hardware, acquiring the hardware, connecting it, wiring it, securing it, securing your data centers. Control the access, installing the software, the virtual machines, all the way up to configuring firewalls, operating systems, and then installing applications and, and your data. Today, we are responsible for all that in your own data centers. But with the cloud, we share this responsibility. At AWS, we are responsible for security of the cloud, and that includes things like the hypervisor, isolation of compute, storage, networking, the data centers themselves, and the perimeter security. Those are things that we are responsible for. But as a customer, you are responsible for building secure applications. Choosing to turn on encryption if you need it. Configuring, properly configuring your firewalls. Putting the right data into the cloud. Those are uh, responsibilities that you take on. We share it together. But as the services have evolved over time, we've introduced new services that make it easier for you. I'd like to give the example of a database. Traditionally, you would install a virtual machine, install the database software, and you'd be responsible for patching that operating system, patching that database, and working with the database. But you know, over time, we introduced a managed service where we give you an endpoint to use that is a database endpoint, but you cannot log into the operating system where it's written. You cannot log in to patch the database. So as a managed service for databases, we've taken on some of that security and ownership, which is why in the middle, some of that orange is shifted up, so it's not static. And then we talk about partners and other SaaS solutions. You know, it goes up even higher. We may not even be able to get access to your AWS console. Partner or 
provide or the abstract that service is doing on your behalf. So it's not a dynamic responsibility, it does change. So let's talk about our global infrastructure. So it is unique in terms of cloud providers. Today, we have 69 availability zones over 22 geographic regions. So we define a region as a physical location around the world where we cluster data centers. And I'll show you the next slide in a minute that will define it in more detail. But what you're seeing on the screen are the orange circles that represent our regions. And in that is a little number that probably can't be, but it represents the number of what we call availability zones. The next slide will dive deeper into what that is. And the green circles represent upcoming announced regions that will be launched. It's not a full list, we're always continually building based on customer pattern or customer input. So you'll continue to see us innovating throughout the region. So we talk about a region. Let's zoom in. So inside the region, we have availability zones that are basically logical uh, partition of data centers. In Canada, we have two. In other parts of the world, there are maybe more, four, for example. And in it are one or more data centers all interconnected with redundant networking, power supplies, and they're housed in separate facilities. So this is unique to how uh, we build our regions. And inside an availability zone, it's fully isolated from the structure of one or more data centers. We don't publish the distance between them. What you'll see is a meaningful distance of separation. Uh, for those that want to go deeper and really uncover more information, one of our distinguished engineers, James Hamilton, Google him on, on YouTube, you can go into really interesting detail on how we build our infrastructure. Uh, and many hundreds of servers at scale. Our, our connectivity, there are low latency, low packet loss, and high overall network quality across all our different regions. Several different types of points of presence. And I put this slide up because it's going to impact the next slide in terms of how do you connect to your data centers. And you can connect a variety of ways. You can connect over the internet using a secure TLS connection. You can connect by a VPN connection. Or we have something called direct connect, which is a private link into the AWS platform. We'll talk about that in the next slide. So one thing that you know, I've talked to all my customers in DC is data privacy. And you know, we're concerned about you know, freedom of information and protection and privacy at FIBA. And basically, specifically section 30.1. And the implication here is that by law, you know, personal identifiable information, or PII, must be stored in Canada. And it also says and access in Canada. So that's our legislation. And what are some of the supporting features that we have on AWS to help you with that? So it's a concept of our region that you just talked about, that we have one up in Montreal. And when you put your data or content there, we do not move outside that region. It stays there. You have the ability to move it if you wanted to, but we do not move it. It stays in Canada. What about connectivity? We mentioned the direct connect. The primary fiber path between Vancouver, which is one of the direct connect and point locations that you can connect to, to Montreal, remains in Canada on the primary path. So if you needed to apply or wanted to have data in transit in Canada, this is one of the ways to do it. Establish, establish connectivity to Vancouver the logic to add to your location. Encryption, there's no reason not to encrypt your content, but it's up to you to do it. Like AWS, we make the, like a Home Depot, we provide all the building blocks for you to use, it's up to you to take them and turn it off. You have to turn on encryption, we don't do it for you. Encrypt your data, there's no reason not to. We comply with several ISO standards that you can read about online, including all of our services or GDP. So I'd like to talk a little bit just to highlight some data privacy, just because I know it's on everyone's mind all the time. And the tools are there for you to be compliant. So you can reach out to me if you want to go deeper into any of these topics. So now let's talk a little bit about disaster recovery. Some of the, the points that we've been talking about. And the first one is understanding when I talk about recovery point, recovery time objectives. On a timeline, from left to the past, the right hand side is the future. First one is the recovery point. This could be the time of your last backup. Then something bad happens. Some kind of event that impacts your ability to deliver your service, whether it's a natural disaster or otherwise, it can represent as that fire. So the time between, or the impact between that last backup and 
every point and a disaster represents your data loss. You're doing your backups hourly, daily, and it's, so that time represents your potential data loss. The next is how long does it take for you to get back up and running? And that is your recovery time to check. Some organizations actually have to find SLAs as part of their business kind of continuity, of what they have to try and achieve for the business. So when you're, when you're looking at the slide, think about do you have this today? When was your last backup? How long would it take you to get back up and running? So everyone has their own different answer. So how can AWS help? What do we have and what tools are there? This is a spectrum, uh, so called, people call it cold to hot. Um, and basically, on the left hand side, you have the slowest and cheapest option, which is your backup or store. You have your backups, maybe they're off site, maybe um, they're in a different type of off site storage. But you have backups. Like you have no way to necessarily easily recreate everything. If you're reacquiring servers, installing the back software, restoring backups, and getting up and running. So that's the slowest, the least expensive option. Then we have other ones like a pilot one, where you may have some services running but not at full capacity. And then when it comes time to disaster, you basically crank it on. Just think about a burner on your stove. You crank it up, the pilot light becomes full flame. And of course, warm standby. The solution I'm going to talk about after these, these uh, educational slides will be a solution for a pilot light slash a little warm standby option for you. And then the hot would be the most expensive option but the least amount of downtime, which means you're likely running a complete copy of your infrastructure doing some kind of data synchronization between your live site to the DR site, and in the event of a disaster, the failover is almost immediate. But you're paying for all that, those resources that aren't being used. So those are the spectrum of things that you can try and achieve. So what are some common cloud-based disaster recovery drivers? So you want to improve your recovery point objectives to meet different type of business requirements, if you have to consolidate your DR strategy for multiple different applications, every other application is a different backup or store procedure. Uh, maybe it's an opportunity for you to start to build a skill set, TCO, total cost of ownership reduction. Or maybe it's, you have to do a DR set hardware, hardware refresh, and so now it's time to look at other options. Many different business drivers on here that help you move towards the cloud. So, cloud based disaster recovery for business objectives. You want reliability and availability. You want operational efficiency to reduce the cost of having duplicate infrastructure. You want peace of mind. How many of you are actually able to test your backups? Do you have that existing extra capacity or infrastructure to actually try and do this? Cloud is much easier. So what are some other common disaster recovery challenges? Diverse infrastructure and operating systems, amount of time required to recover the workloads, inadequate testing drills, lots of different things that are challenging that, that you can that you can help. So inability to achieve recovery, recovery objectives. Do you actually have your RPOs and RTOs told to you by the business you have to achieve? If you do, you don't. Difference between DR strategies on-prem versus cloud. So with AWS Cloud, you sign up for an account, there's a zero dollar commitment to spend. Whether you choose to use it or not, you can have your account. So when it comes time to run infrastructure, you just launch what you need and again turn it off and only get billed for what you use. So there's no upfront infrastructure requirements. Um, high upfront costs in the on-premise side that we talked about, but most importantly is that last point, the idle resources just sitting there. So you have a lot of opportunities to be more efficient by doing disaster recovery. So now I'm going to talk about our cloud and your uh, software that we support for disaster recovery. So this is a product that we acquire. It's now built into our website. You can go to AWS Disaster Recovery. That whole page is talking about this software that I'd love to talk to you about. How does it work? It's, it's, it's flexible, replicate from any source. It's an agent that installs into your virtual or physical hardware. And basically, it does block replication on your disks up to a staging area. And I'll show you a, a technical diagram, and I hope to demo this to you as well. So instead of having to worry about the backups and restore of an application, you're actually recovering the entire server because you have all the blocks of those virtual drives or physical drives up in the cloud. Reliability. So the key messaging on this one that I want to highlight is that your RPO, the recovery point objective, is sub-second. When this agent is installed on your, on your machine, as 
as your application or your database is making changes, it's actually writing to a block disk. This agent looks for those changes on your disk and replicates them asynchronously and encrypted up into a staging area. That happens in sub-second. So your RPO, sub-second. Your recovery time objective takes, takes um, maybe 10 minutes. So with my demo, I'll show you. You'll have sub-second replication change blocks. It'll take about 10, 10 minutes, and this is going to take as much as 15 minutes to actually recreate a whole virtual machine in the cloud, an exact copy of those virtual disks. So your RT, RTO is around 10 to 15 minutes in this example. So you get sub-second, RTO, and RTO minutes. It's highly automated. It's pretty easy to get going and set up. I'll show you how it works. It's easy, non-disruptive DR tests. You can actually launch and test in the cloud, have it all set up for you to go test, and then destroy it when you're done your test to see how did it actually replicate, which is my DR story. And there's lots of ways for you to automate. I'm not going to be able to show it to you today in the demo, but what I have, what's possible is if you run a production website on-prem, you can detect failure, and on that failure, automate DR story to automatically pick up and recover, update your DNS entries to point to you. You have the opportunity to use these building blocks to automate. And you can also fail back, which is something I haven't talked about. So once it's up and running in the cloud, you recover on prem. You can actually reverse the direction and restore it back. So fail back is possible. So, how does this cloud endure software work? This is high level picture. Is, it's getting a little bit technical, but on the left hand side it could be a corporate data center, it could even do cloud, cloud virtual machines. In this example, there are two servers running, two databases, and you can see a total of five different disks attached. Three disks attached on the top, virtual machine, two on the bottom. And up top is a cloud in your user console, which is the application you use to interface with the product. Once a replication begins happening, the blocks of those disks get replicated up to a staging area on AWS. Those machines aren't fully running. There is a receiving virtual machine that's accepting those blocks to copy them to a corresponding virtual disk in the cloud. In the event of the, the time where you need to test or actually execute failover, a whole new uh, network area gets created. The virtual machine gets started with those copied volumes attached to those drives. Those become your failover virtual machines. And I'm going to demo this to you so you can see what it's We have a wide platform of support, any application, any database, operating systems, and different infrastructure. If you see something up there and you think it may not work for you, send me an email. I'm curious if you can get the product team to help go through those use cases. It's a wide, a wide range of different types of applications that you can protect using this software. So, how do you obtain uh, your licenses? So, we have something called a marketplace, which is like store, a curated software platform where you can go and browse various different types of products. And searching on Common Jira will reveal the disaster recovery option for you, uh, where you can go in your AWS account to create a subscription to protect the number of virtual machines that you want. It's license-based, so the virtual machines you want to protect, you can get a license for, and then you can be able to instantly protect your virtual machines. Okay, so I am moving quickly in the interest of time. But let me just give you a little Demo. And it's always a little dangerous to be live demo, so see alongside the internet connectivity. Good. So, what you're seeing here is the DR, sorry, Cloud Endure console. When I click on machines, you're seeing two machines being protected. I have a web server at the bottom there, a Drupal web server, Postgres database supporting it. Each of those two virtual machines have this Cognitor agent installed and running it. And the initial synchronization has been done, and those blocks are now being protected in AWS Cloud. The first one I'm going to show you, I'm going to try and show you two things. I have another Windows machine sitting right here that I'm uh, remoted into. And I want you to notice two things. I have a C drive and an F drive, two virtual volumes. One is 37 gigabytes, and the other one is 7 gigabytes. I've chosen odd numbers like this to help illustrate the other side of it when you see it replicating. But picture those numbers in your mind. I've downloaded the Cloud Endure agent on the desktop, and I have ready to go a command line to execute it. You could do this through the interface of the tool, but basically I'm providing the installer name, 
my access key and basically go to the left. Yeah. So if I hit execute on this, it's going to actually attempt to connect to the console, download a new agent, and then connect uh, to my cloud so This whole process takes just over one minute. A lot of what's doing that, we're going to show you a little bit of what it looks like on the AWS side. So if you remember from that diagram, I showed you where the blocks move, that's the diagram I'm referring to, that there was a running replication server. It's a very small instance that's running. Very, it's not very powerful. All it has to do is accept blocks being sent out from your on time environment, for example. And there's a virtual volume. This one is the one that's just running the operating system on that replication server. And there's two volumes here, 30 gigabytes. One is the web server, the other one is the database. And these are the target endpoints for those blocks that are being replicated. What you'll see is that once this new machine that I just registered gets properly configured, two new disks will be created. One that is for that 37 gigabyte and one for the 7 gigabyte. It will take a minute, and as long as I haven't made a mistake, it has it's finished successfully. If we flip back to the Avenger console, we now see this machine registered, and it's registered because it passed in the token that corresponds to this project. And now it's in the process of creating the disks on AWS. So I hit refresh here and may see some action. So there's the 7 gigabyte and the 37 gigabyte. So that, it's that easy to get the agent installed configured to begin the transfer of replication of blocks. Now it'll take maybe 15 minutes for this initial phase to, to complete. The more data you have, of course, the longer it takes for the initial synchronization. But you get the idea. The last thing I'm going to show you is how do you fail to work? And I'm going to select these two instances. You have an option to test or do a recovery. So I will do a test mode. It's going to ask me which recovery point I would want to go for. And all of this is automatic. So you're seeing that it has 10 minute snapshots that you can go back in time to. If I choose the latest one, I'm going to hit continue to launch. A couple things are happening now behind the scenes. A snapshot is being taken of the latest rise. You should see some in a provisioning state. Okay. So it gets going too far. And then new volumes will be created. And this is the part that takes about 10 minutes. New snapshot is being created, and eventually you will see the web server and database server show up here. The whole process, like I guess, it takes about 10 minutes. You have the ability to watch the progress. The job status here. So it's an appendix state, most likely because I have the other one running at the same time. We have auto logs, so you can see all the activity that's happening on your different agents. You have the different ability to set up and create your projects. And in the recovery plan, we have the ability to group and set stages of the recovery order of virtual machines. If you're doing Active Directory, likely you're deploying that first, waiting until it's up and running, and then deploying your other Windows off, Windows workloads, like a database or uh, a website. So, really easy to get up and running. Put one more back here, Let's see how we're doing on the line snapshots. So, you can see the snapshots here in the pending state. This is in that 10 minute time frame before you get up and running with a complete copy of your protected contributions. So I moved pretty quick here in terms of content and demo. So I hope you saw something new today. My time is up before I pass it over to Mark. So what you just see is uh, basically a full backup all done. Now imagine that you have 100 workstations sitting on your uh, you know, premise environment, you got a fiber connection in there, boom, you're done. So these are the fastest ways now to go through and get all of your applications up into the cloud. The question comes into a little bit is, what does Fusebar do that with respect to all of this? So if you look at all of that stuff, we actually have an operations center in Vancouver. We have another operations center in Johannesburg. So on all of those different regions, we basically do our own replication of teams across the globe in order to go through and operate all of this infrastructure for our customers. So part of what we do here is, and we talked about this in the lives in our earlier session today, we have two things that we cover off in our operation shop. 
Number one is we do security. So we have a SecOps team. So everything that you've got there in the way of, if you think about business continuity, you've been hacked. How do you go through and recover from it? You've got a ransomware attack. How do we go through and protect the ransomware attack? So part of what we do is we help to be part of that team and help you manage and recover from ransomware attacks or actually be there interactively going through and monitoring all the security. Whether you're using the AWS cloud, whether you're using an on-premise data center, or whether you're using some other third-party cloud provider, we have our few secure product, which sits right on top of the AWS. It's deployed in Montreal, it's deployed in Ireland, it's deployed in Virginia, it's deployed in Oregon, it's deployed in Frankfurt. We basically use AWS as multi-region capability with still making sure that we have data compliance all taken care of. So if you're a government sector counting Canada, you don't want any of your data ever going outside of Canada, we keep everything located in Montreal, and our operating team are always Canadians looking at the Canadian operation. So we don't go and send any things out of the border. That helps us with all the compliance requirements of the uh, of the, 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 the other part that we have is we also deal with the, the UK. We also deal with the Europeans, which means GDR, GDPR is very big for us in order to go through and manage all that compliance. Um, I was I was hearing EWS has got ISO 27018. Our shops are also at ISO 27001 certified and compliant. And we continue to add more and more certifications to our team. So that's all that we provide. And we're very much focused on public sector as well as commercial entities in order to provide all of that security operations as an occupation either to your team today or as basically a direct, we will take care of it all for you as a, as a turnkey service. Now, second part to this, and this is really where part of the cloud and jerk comes in, and some of that stuff aside of the PR. So we actually had cases where, you know, um, I've been in a data center and we had an old legacy data center operator who was providing cloud. They're running blank systems. They were using remote hands. Somebody that was in remote hands went into the data center and they unplugged two outlets. And what did they unplug? The whole SAN infrastructure. They brought down a complete environment for 17 hours, basically, and it was actually a railway in the United Kingdom when they did that. Okay? Now, people don't even realize, well, that was just bringing down the sand. We kept calling and said, why are you doing this? Why are you doing this? And, and are you recovering? And how are you recovering? And this was where we were basically, this was, this was 10 years ago. And this is why we basically migrated now just use AWS for all of our infrastructure, because we have that multi-region, multi zone capability. So if you got remote hands going into your data center, I don't know, I run data centers, so it's scary when I sit here and say, you got remote hands, so I want my guys in that cage. And then the part is, is even if they just jiggle it and there's a bad cable, all of a sudden you've got a connectivity issue and you're down. The global infrastructure and being able to use multi-data centers in AWS and AZs is the part that goes and helps you manage and manage those kind of failure instances here. Now that's kind of like operational runtime. DR is another part. So part of what we provide is we've got another product in here called Fuse Control. And again, it sits on top of the AWS. What you saw from Ryan showing you those consoles, we work with those. We actually do all the work for our customers if we need to, or we work with their teams, your teams to actually go through and educate, coach, and manage jointly, or we basically go through and configure it up and then hand over the keys and then you operate yourself, depending on which way you do. Okay? And what do we do with that? We go everything from the application. So if you've got it, everybody's running an application. We work on the application infrastructure configuration. We work on the, the application platform configuration, which is databases and database recovery. And then we also work on things like the runtime configurations. How do you manage WebSphere? How do you manage IIS? How do you ensure that when you want to add more servers to your cluster, that they're all properly configured exactly the same? And we're able to use the same images all the time. And that helps you go through and manage that whole environment. And what we do is we narrow down what the customer responsibility is so that it's more on the application configuration and data management within the application. 